And if that client can't get a perfect dead drift, it may not matter if they bump it, twitch it. And, and sometimes I have them bumping and twitching it a lot, you know, through the moss. And... That one hit the front one. It seems like less hit the lead fly than hit the middle to the back fly. It's almost like the middle flies get more action than anything. I'd be interested to see that rig on a tippet ring. Three, two, Josh asked, what's the number one mistake that anglers make when fishing a dry fly on a tailwater? I think my answer would be fishing a dry fly on the tailwater a lot of times, meaning that a lot of times you see a rise, it's not a mouth coming up, it's more a back or a tail coming and they're more eating the mergers. So you get that false sense of security of, oh, they're eating off top, so I'm going to throw my favorite dry fly on whatever that is. And I'm going to start fishing that. You fish the crap out of it. You get hung up on it for a long time sometimes, you know, for hours. You know, thinking that you're going to make this fish rise, and fish wasn't rising to your dry or dry in the first place. There's no head popping up. There's no bubble there where they leave an air bubble whenever they come up to eat. I mean, it's straight up a back coming out of the water, but you saw that rise, and you're like, I'm on this one. I'm tying my favorite dry fly on. So, I don't know. I would say probably fishing a dry when they're really eating the mergers. That's kind of the biggest mistake that I see that anglers make, especially when you first get on the, you know, the first couple years on the tailwater, you keep falling into that little trap so i don't know jordan what do you think what do you think the number one mistake anglers make when they're fishing a dry is and i guess this is looking at it from a in a dry fly situation where they were actually eating off the top and fishing to one specific fish maybe and, and this is probably the case with nymphin and, and other things as well but just repeatedly drifting over the same fish over and over and not giving it a break not taking it away you know, make a nice, perfect drift if he doesn't eat it. Don't put it right back in the same spot and, and beat that spot just over and over and over. Like, be patient and take it away and put it somewhere else that's maybe not as good for two minutes and then bring it back to that spot. So rest the fish a little bit. Rest the, yeah, don't don't show it to them over and over and over super quick. That's an easy mistake to make because you can sit there and just think that I'm going to make this fish rise whether he wants to rise or not. He's coming up sooner or later. And it's usually a dry that you have a lot of confidence in. So you're like, oh, I know he's going to eat this or no, that right. fish has got to eat this fly. Just kind of playing snooker with them a little bit. I feel like I learned that on that river in Colorado, the Conejos River, throwing big salmon flies. And I had like an elk hair caddis behind it or something like size 14. Big, big salmon fly and a, a elk hair behind it and um it was so cool man i mean i would see fish like come up and look at it but then kind of disappear back and i would take it away for a little bit and then put it back and catch that fish and sometimes even had them come look at it three times we caught them on the third time we got to kind of be patient with wait for those good opportunities matt what do you think instantly i, I first thought about size not picking the right size because all the time i'll have guys uh you, you said man throw this one so well, i can't see it so they instantly just pick something bigger right but today i I was actually fishing a um, yellow sally hatch with a with a guy catching some nice fish on dries. But guys that never fish dry flies, I find that they still fish them like a nymph. They cast way too far upstream, try to mend it, it sinks, and then they have no idea where their fly is the whole rest of the drift. And I see that over and over again is guys don't know how to convert. It's not a nymph. You know, you don't have to cast it so far upstream and don't mend it. But yeah, I think that they just lose sight of the fact that, you know, they don't get to fish a dry often. So just don't grasp that, hey, maybe make a reach cast instead of casting so far upstream and making a mend that you're going to sink it. Then they're making a hundred false casts trying to dry it off. And it's like, dude, don't wave that thing over that fish's head so many times. I think just that would be my, my number one thing, I think, is people just don't know how to translate the difference in technique, the difference in approach fishing for rising fish, just because they don't get enough experience of it. You know, we have a a couple fun hatches a year that we fish tiny, delicate dry flies, and that's not many. I mean, you're considering we're on the water or can be on the water 365 days a year. If you don't fish dries a lot and you've got like a delicate tippet on, yeah, you don't have to set like you're setting a nymph trying to drag it up out of the water you know it's i mean let's face it every one of us on this call have done it before oh yeah we see it too but i like to say that most of the mistakes all the mistakes that somebody's made i've made a thousand times so 
you know, and still still making some. I picked up the rod today to set set an example, and and um, man, I, I there was this fish rising by this rock, and I'd made a couple drifts by him, and he denied it, and I changed the fly, and man, he came up and hit it on that last time he hit it. I was so excited. I, I mean, I set the hook so hard, I straightened the hook out on him. You know, it was just like, come on, Matt, you know, like, <laughs> what are you doing, son? But it happens. Yeah, I, I know better than this. I don't think I've seen a client do anything besides fall out of the boat one day that I haven't done before. Yeah. I hadn't fallen out of the boat yet, knock on wood. Sure. But everything else I've done, if I hadn't done it exactly, I've done it something close enough to say it's exact. That's right. From high atop the world headquarters of Southeastern Fly, this is our Wisdom from the Guides episode, round four, the top ten southern tailwater flies. Thanks for stopping in and giving us a listen. Feel free to share this with your friends and your fishing partners. Most of all, please subscribe or follow. Now we're following on uh, on all the Apple products versus subscribe. So let's talk about the format for the Wisdom from the Guides, round four. What we're going to do, we've got three of us on the call today. Me from right here in, in Murfreesboro. Let me introduce you to the other two. To. So let's welcome back to Southeastern Fly and welcome to Wisdom from the Guides for his first time around. He's the owner of Rising River Guides in, in Cotter, Arkansas. He's a longtime guide and an excellent angler. He's the guest on episode 26 of uh, Southeastern Fly, Fly Fishing the White River. Let's welcome back Matt Milner. Matt, welcome back, brother. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Yeah, cheers. And our second guest today is another Arkansas guide. He guides for Rouse Fly Fishing. He guides on the Little Red River. He's a lifelong angler, and I've been talking to him a little bit. He's a fishy dude. Welcome to the podcast, Jordan Case. Jordan, thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it, man. Glad to be here. Well, let's get started with the format. So we want to help the angler who's listening do a couple things here. So we want to talk about our favorite flies for fishing tailwaters. And we've got three different perspectives, me in Middle Tennessee, Jordan kind of mid-Arkansas, Matt is uh, more in northern Arkansas on the white, currently Matt's out in Steamboat uh, with a host trip and matt let's talk about that just a second here sure let's talk about what the weather's like and that sort of thing so tell us tell the listener out there a little bit about what the weather's like what the fishing's like and what your experience is like right now because it's a little bit different than what maybe i i'm used to in colorado at the time of year that i go you know i've been doing this trip basically in a two-week window from this since 2012 um i do it with my old business partner out here uh, yampa valley anglers and traditionally, you know, the river's flowing somewhere, um, you know, a couple thousand CFS maybe on a high year to 1,000, 1,200, 1,800 is kind of, you know, really great water. And I think the river dropped today at like 250, 250 CFS. Mm. We've got three fires kind of within a 100-mile range. One of them, I can see the flames from Steamboat um, coming over Muddy Pass. And, um, you know, water's warm and there's no snow in the state anywhere, hardly. It was pretty scary driving up from um, Denver, coming over through Summit County, which usually has tons and tons of snow. And Green Mountain Reservoir looks like it does in September. You know, this is by far the lowest I've ever seen the Yampa River on June 23rd. So it's a little different experience, but we're catching some nice fish on dry flies. We're just wade fishing more and fishing the extreme lower river where there's a few more tributaries and stuff coming in. But it's definitely a different experience than, um, you know, years past where you're ducking to get your drift boat under a bridge, uh, you know, so it's definitely <laughs> different. Well, I think Jordan and I both are hating on you just a little bit for being able to be out there, even if the conditions aren't real great, but still, it, it is nice. It's a for nice sure. place to be. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It it still gets down to about, you know, 40 to 49 degrees every night. So that's a pretty pleasant experience. So that's what I'm talking about. That's why we're mad. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. I heard y'all got a nice little cool front, Jordan. Yeah, it was nice. So let's transition back to the episode here. So what we're doing is we, we've got three of us together here. Uh, given three different points of view, we're all coming at this from a little bit different angle. That's kind of the premise behind Wisdom from the Guides is to get a little bit different perspective from different waters to kind of give the listener out there an opportunity to experience other waters or, or see if they want to experience all the other, other waters. So like I said, Matt's coming at it from the White River. I'm coming at it from Middle Tennessee. Jordan's coming at it from the Little Red. So we've got those those different perspectives to the same questions, to the same fly types. So bugs are going to be a little different. Maybe I approach it from a little bit different way than both of these guys. There's no right or wrong way. There may be some ways that are a little better than others. 
There may be some flies that are a little better than others. There may be some techniques that we use with those flies that may be a little bit better than others. And those are the things that we want to help somebody understand and, and maybe take back to the, their own home waters in some cases, but also be able to take if they're coming coming to the little red, coming to the caney, coming to the to the white be able to bring something with them to get them kick started they want to come and fish so so let's finish this conversation about dry flies and matt we talked you you talked a little bit about technique and where to cast and and the difference between dries and nymphs and that the presentation piece but let's talk about your favorite tailwater dry fly well david you know that question was was hard for me um we just got done having a really amazing caddis hatch uh, that lasted for a good six weeks or so and um, a lot of nice fish were caught on caddis dries, but, and so I was tempted to go there, but what I did instead was choose the fat Albert and went for more of a terrestrial just because that truly is my favorite bite. It's my favorite way to fish. If I could just have one way to go catch a nice brown on the white river, that's the way I would choose to do it. So a little different than uh, maybe a traditional dry fly, but fat Albert is, is definitely my bug of choice. I would feel we're confident enough going out on a guided, um, hopper fishing trip with only that one pattern in my box i might have multiple colors multiple sizes but i would feel plenty comfortable uh, with just that one pattern in my box and, and confident that i could catch fish on it all summer long how would you fish it i traditionally fish them uh, very tight to shore i like 45 degrees downstream tight to shore um, i tell people traditionally i want that fly within a shoe box distance of the bank and i like long drifts and long leaders and you know really just running those banks looking for that big boy that's laid up sleeping resting chilling feeding whatever you know but i don't do much hopper dropper i fish just a single um bug traditionally i like the shoe box yeah i like that distance that's a that gives me a real good perspective yep like instantly okay i know exactly how far you want it that's right that's right i think i find that that people in me sometimes too they want to fish a little too tight to shore sure you know they want to be two or three inches offshore not that you can't catch fish there especially if the bank is dropping pretty quick you know like you got a overhanging bank or something like that that's a little bit different than you know a slope bank and that's right and reading the banks is pretty important there too absolutely are you are you fishing on high water low water what what's your most favorite water to fish i would if i could have my choice you know the white river we have our flows that fluctuate from you know minimum flow let's say 700 cfs ish um to eight units 25 grand uh so if i could have my choice for hopper fishing i would like to pick something between like five and and eight thousand cfs that's high enough water that it's high enough water it's going to push those fish to the edges and um you know i'm going to have still a big enough gap from the tree line down to the water's edge that you can get up underneath those and you know really fish it but it's not so much water that um fish don't want to move you know right so if it's up if it's let's say let's just take five thousand cfs how deep are the banks a shoebox off you know um five thousand just a little over a generator it's like a generator and a half two generators for us so you know there might be a lot of times in that depth that you might actually end up being you know three feet off the bank because the first two feet are only you know six to 18 inches of water now there still could be a fish in that but a lot of times i'll find in that flow he's going to be on the first drop off so jordan let's look at it from the little red river perspective what what's your favorite dry fly i don't dry fly fish much i wish i could go to work and fish dry flies every day i think that'd be really cool and here lately there actually has been a, some pretty cool dry fly action happening in the afternoons i've went and enjoyed it a couple times myself and the few days with clients and big mayflies it's been really cool but if i had to choose an all-around dry fly for the little red river i would probably go with the blue wing olive fairly traditional but there's no doubt it works throughout the months that a lot of people are out fishing starting about right now i mean maybe a couple of weeks ago I was seeing some actually, but it'll pretty much last all summer and, and end of September, October. Definitely really productive. Something I may not do often, guiding, but when I fished myself a lot back in the day, I definitely fished a, a dry blue wing olive. So I've been on a little red. I've been on really, really, really low water. And I've been on however many generators they have. I haven't been spilling or anything like that. So what type of, what water level do you like? This would generally be lower water weighting. That would be a pattern you'd be using in that situation. Uh, size 18, 
you know, wading in shoals, you know, fishing slow water or riffles, but I always like to catch them in the riffles, a little quicker moving water. Gives you a little camouflage, gives you a little... A little easier pickings. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. No doubt. So when I came to, to Middle Tennessee, I was I came from Knoxville, so there's a little more gradient in the streams there. Even in the tailwaters in East Tennessee, there's more gradient, so more rocks, more drop-offs, more smaller plunge pools a lot of times, more shelves, more stuff like that. So I was fishing a, a Thunderhead, which it's got lots of hackle. You know, the hackle standing up. The fly kind of rests on its tail and its hackle. You know, it's made for those high gradient streams. So I, I started looking at parachute things, parachute flies, whenever I came out here. Uh, and started fishing if i when i got the opportunity to to dry fly fish i think i'm more in the in the boat with jordan of and eh, maybe there's some opportunities to do it like right now for some reason uh we're catching some fish on dries they're not big they're not huge but right i started looking for the fly that maybe laid a little flatter in the water maybe laid in the film a little bit better so naturally they transitioned to a parachute and i kind of got like on this parachute adams kick for a while and then somewhere along the line, I I ordered this parachute pheasant tail dry. And I thought, I'm just going to give it a shot. It, more iridescent, you know, the color changes and all that. So it's got a little flair to it. Uh, it's a little bougie, maybe. And I, I, I ordered some 12s, and I ordered some all the way down to 18. I think anything less than that kind of turns to a, more of a dry midge for me. Eventually, I started getting some 20s in there, but, you know, it's it's hard to see. There's that, that thin tippet. You can set the hook a little hard, you know, sometimes and break it off. So tried to go up, and I, I tried dropping the midge off of it, which I still kind of do some. Yeah. You know, it kind of gets to the point where if I'm going to drop a midge off of it, I'm going to go back to a to an indicator uh, a lot of times. The parachute floats kind of flat. You know, it will hold a small small midge if you need it to, but we're going to fish it on more low water. Like, even falling water sometimes is a little high uh, for us, but low water kind of fishing the tail outs. Uh, if I can get in a riffle with it, I will, but, you know, lower water is a little bit of, I'm using air quotes again, a little bit of a riffle with low water, but it's nothing really, it's not East Tennessee-ish, you know. It's not Western North Carolina-ish. Uh, it would certainly not Colorado. Uh, Matt, you're out there in a steamboat. That fly would work probably pretty well on a lot of parts of the yamp on that lower part, you know, from like the the pig pen down to, you know, around the dump. Oh, that part down there, probably a little better than it would up in steamboat along the walking trail or whatever that is. So, I mean, there's some places in there that is pretty good, but that fly just seems to really work uh, for me even better than I hate to say it. I mean, a parachute Adams is a fantastic fly. And, um, I think Ian Rudder put it best over a million fish have been served on a parachute Adams, but this fly, this, this pheasant tail dry, which I've only found one place to get them. And I, those flies really work for me. And it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different take on a fly, you know, on a dry, because everybody thinks pheasant tail, they, oh, well, that's a, that's a nymph choice, you know, pheasant tails work. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, no, they don't. I mean, no, they don't work, right? Ne never fish right. a pheasant tail, Never right? work. <laughs> yeah. so, so all shapes, colors, and sizes. Yeah, and you can really you can you can doll them up a little bit, and they they're still going to work and be pretty good. So you can do so much on the vice sometimes that you dial a fly out, but with a pheasant tail, you can kind of dial. You can kind of do just. Not anything with them, but you can do a lot of different things with them, and they'll still produce. Some, some ways fish better, you know, catch fish better than others, but they're pretty forgiving. Jordan, I'm going to go back to the Little Red for a minute, and I want to talk about tailwater nymphs. What's your favorite tailwater nymph? I chose the red ass with a tungsten bead slid up on it, just with the normal peacock curl and red thread, typically using a, a mallard feather instead of a partridge feather. And, and tying a mallard flank feather in front ways and then bending it back and build your thread up on the front end. Seems to stick out a little bit more. But I just chose it because it's uh, it's a forgiving fly. Uh, you can fish it as a top fly. You can fish it, you know, with the dropper beneath it. You can fish it behind a streamer if you wanted to, using it as a dropper under bigger nymphs. It's just a super versatile fly and with a little weight 
on it, like a one eighth or a seven sixty fourth tungsten bead. I mean, it's just deadly. And I do fish it a lot under certain other flies. Don't use it as a top fly much, but you could. You could put a red ass up top and drop a midge under it and probably whack them. I just dropping it behind a streamer is just that's that is deadly. And I don't know if it's the fish being attracted to the bigger fly and then and then turn it off onto the smaller fly. But I fish it behind marabou jigs all the time under an indicator, fishing a marabou jig with a red ass behind it. Yeah, definitely do that quite a bit. What type of water do you fish it on the most, I guess, the best? I would say medium, not super high, not super low, probably a thousand CFS, 700 maybe on our river and using it as a dropper, say under a marabou jig or, or some other type of heavier fly. And if that client can't get a perfect dead drift, it may not matter if they bump it, twitch it. And, and sometimes I have them bumping and twitching it a lot, you know, through the moss and they seem to want to get it on the move, you know. Is there a lot of moss on the, on the little red this year? Uh, yeah, you know, we've had high water for a couple months now, so it's starting to kind of, you know, keep it at bay, at least on the middle to lower river but upriver is definitely a major moss issue is it choking out seems like it i was actually talking to somebody about it today they'll all try to pack into one little hole absolutely i think some moss is good though don't you jordan oh absolutely i think there's a, a, a definitely a happy medium i think it's probably one reason our browns are so successful at spawning not only are they successful at spawning but i think they're successful at surviving as a baby fry a fry living in there yeah they can just disappear into that moss i mean it, and there's just endless places for a, a fry to hide you talking about a fry going in and hiding in the grass I, I released a 14 inch fish on monday and it went and hit, it went and hit in the grass and i never saw it again crazy how they can get in there and get lost I think our Browns, I mean, they're, they're hiding in it every day for and sure. Very hard to catch because of it. I mean, you to get a good proper dead drift through the moss without your client hanging up on the moss right in front of the fish is virtually impossible in a lot of areas. Yeah. I mean, it's just impossible. They've got to know how to kind of bump it, twitch it. That's probably why I fish that way so much, kind of having them flutter it into each different trough, you know, different hallways. Yeah. Of, of moss with deeper stretches in between and they can't just pick one dead drift and stay with that same dead drift for 30 yards a lot of times they may have to lift the rod tip and slowly pull it back and then drop it moving that rod you can do a lot with a fly with throwing far every time if you want to throw far and you can lift your rod and strip back and pull that fly and fish your way back to the boat and hit multiple different locations on the way back you know Especially with a soft hackle type fly, I mean, where it's pulsing. For sure. Yeah. So, Matt, how about you? I mean, we've talked about dries. We've talked about presentations. Let's move on to your nymph here. What uh, What's your favorite tailwater nymph? I can't answer that, but I can answer my favorite White River uh, nymph, I think. And I, I, I struggled with this one, too. I, I went through a million different choices. I don't really like to have to pick favorites, but... I think the most versatile fly for me that catches the most fish year round in dead low water and in super high water is David Knoll's uh, Ruby Midge. It's a classic White River pattern, fun to tie. You can tie it in various sizes, shapes, or whatever, but, you know, scud hook or straight shank hook or copper bead or silver bead. But I may not always fish it by itself. It may be below a dry or, you know, behind another bigger nymph or uh, whatnot, but Nine times out of 10, if you give them two choices and one of them is a ruby midge, they're going to pick that ruby midge. And so I think that I think that I would have to choose that to be my favorite White River nymph, my confidence bug. Okay, yeah, confidence bug. That's probably a better way to put it than your favorite tailwater nymph because it really is about confidence. That's and right. Maybe that's I, I have I feel confident. The person fishing it now feels confident. They're going to listen a little better. I hear it in my own voice sometimes where I'm like, eh. This particular piece of water fish kind of crappy yesterday, so it's probably going to, you know. <laughs> so let's put this on, and let's, okay, let's do that. You catch a fish in there, and you feel like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I did something right, or they did something right. You know, the confidence bug helps that a little bit. And then, of course, catching a fish cures all ails. But a confidence fly, so do you think that it's, do you think that you fish it differently, Matt? Or do you think it's just that it's worked for you so many times in the past? Or tell me how you get there. 
I think, um, you know, it's just always worked for me and a whole lot of other people too. You know, it's one of those bugs that it's not a secret, you know, I mean, there's, there's nobody that fishes the white river doesn't know what the Ruby midge is, you know, I mean, they may be fishing a too big a one or too small a one or the wrong color head on it or what have you. But I've always fished rubies when I, when I fished the white, even before I got it on the white full time, you know, I mean, that was just head to the white, you better tie a bunch of rubies, you know, I mean, that was just always it. So it doesn't matter if it's during a, a hatch or, a, you know, anything. I just, I still put that ruby on below it. Give, give me an idea. I don't think I've ever fished it, believe it or not. I don't even, I know I've heard of it. And a friend of mine is tied a, a midge similar to it. How would you, how do you build them? Sure. The traditional fly that David Knowles um, created, created is on like a straight chain cook whether you wanted that to be a you know nw1 or nw3 or uh, something along those lines and it is traditionally got a silver bead on it uh, the body is red magnum flashaboo and it's got you know black ribbing and uh, some not with wire like a coats and clark thread uh you know so it's got a little texture to it a little more than a you know a utc thread or something may and then i just hit it with a little dab of sally hansen's hard as nails to you know firm her up not tough to tie at all it sounds like it sounds like fairly easy well that's also that's also what makes flies um you know <laughs> favorites for me if I got a client that's going to lose 20 of them in a day you know i certainly don't want them to take it forever to tie <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. I've I've probably lost twenty of my own in a day too. So what the hell I'm laughing about? <laughs> so well, I guess guess for me. So it's there's a lot of midges here. There's a lot of midge action here. I guess I should say in in Middle Tennessee on, on pretty much any of the tailwaters. There's four four tailwaters here within two hours of me. Uh, if I go east another hour, I pick up a couple of more, and they start transitioning into different types of bugs over there. But in Middle Tennessee, it's, there's a lot of midge action. The full one, one for my favorite nymph would be, and I'm going to stick with kind of a theme here. I'm not going to go there on our next question, but for right now, my favorite nymph would probably be a pheasant tail. Here I am, you know, pheasant tail dries, pheasant tail nymphs, so it kind of limits my my need for all these exotic uh, materials. Are you going classic flashback or, or not? David's a pretty dull boy. So it's just pheasant tail fibers, copper wire, usually a copper bead, peacock curl, you know, wing case, a little bit of wing with just regular, regular pheasant tail fibers. So I don't get exotic. Uh, I've got a lot of friends that get exotic. They, they'll kind of veer away from the peacock curl a little bit more. Then that's that's kind of anything. Some people will add add the red ass to it too, which I've done that too. But I'm I'm more traditional, I guess, with that. The only thing I'm a little bit different on there is probably since there this is there's a lot of midge action here, and midge just kind of swim, you know, in a curve. Uh, if you if you look at them, they're curved usually. So I'll tie it on a curved hook and I'll curve it too. I'll run way down the hook in the back so that I get, you know, that curve profile. That seems to work pretty good. Kind of oversize the bead so it gets down in their face real quick. As quick as I can get it in their face, get down there and make them make a decision if I can. That really seems to work best for me. And we were talking the other day, I really like falling water. You got a little bit of movement in there. With the water, it's pushing it a little bit. They've got to make a decision. Hopefully, they decide right and eat. You know, put it in their face as much as you can. Get as dead a drift as you can. Works best with a dead drift for me, and that doesn't matter if you're putting it under an indicator. It works real good there. You know, you can high stick it or you can you can euro nymph it. It works good there. So that's that. Those are kind of the things that I like to do. But I think the number one thing. So I'm a little bit backwards probably than ninety nine point nine nine percent of the people out there. I usually fish it by itself. Period. I put nothing below it, nothing above it. I don't even like. I don't like to even have lead if I up above it if I can get away with it. And most of the time I can get away with it. I just I think you get into those little micro currents down there. You can fish in two flies and maybe one's pulling one way, one's pulling the other. You would never see it. You would never even probably feel it, but it can be there. Yeah, I go through major phases of fishing one fly only and then I'll be fishing two and then I'm back to one. I have a lot of confidence in one fly. Anybody can fish one fly better than two. From my perspective, you know, hitting bottom less is a big deal. You know, with one fly, I can throw it up into those little pockets, let it set for a little bit, and uh, not worry about, you know, hitting bottom. If I have that dropper on there, I hit bottom. Yeah, exactly. How about you, Matt? You fish one nymph a lot. Never, never. Uh, when I when I fished the little red, I did, absolutely, because it's it's like a gigantic spring creek when the water's low. You know, but on the White River with minimum flow and on the North Fork with minimum flow, I mean, 
I would say the only fly I ever fished and, you know, maybe arguably not be a nymph, uh, would be like a soft tackle or wet fly, you know? I mean, that's about the only thing I don't want to drop her on, but I might use that soft tackle as a dropper, but I will still fish them by themselves very, very rarely. Yeah, it's that crystal clear water, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Flowing crystal clear water. That's, that's you know, I mean, a midge works down here, obviously, all the time. Um, but there's a lot of times, you know, in the spring where our water's more green, off color. I may do better with the smaller nymph than a midge. Mm-hmm. But like when I go up there, I definitely notice that that midge is, I mean, they're going to see it. I mean, even in big high water, I mean, they, they see that midge up there more so, so than they see it here in the green water. What, what's the water like where you're at, David? So more in the spring through right now, it's pretty clear. As time goes on through the summer, I think that the plants are in the lake start releasing whatever plants in the lake release and that color starts turning it kind of green and in, in one tail water it, it gets real green and then the other tail water it gets kind of they'll turn the sluice on and it's green chocolate kind of i don't know it's kind of more brown uh in the fall and then in the winter it clears back up you know once once they once the plants do all the things that they're going to do or that's that's an assumption so don't write me a letter it's an assumption i realize it's, a, it's an assumption it's a guess but it kind of transitions from clear onto milky green brown the other one is clear to milky green not as much brown depends on which one i'm on and then there's another one the obey it's it's pretty clear most of the year it comes out of dale hollow lake which is maybe a little bit deeper so it stays a little clear for the most part it starts getting a little bit of green in the fall it sounds fairly similar to here as far as you know got more of a green tint i mean it's still clear i mean the visibility very you know you can see a good ways in it those you know norfolk lake and bull shoals lake north of here definitely have more of a gin clear just harder bottom you know we got limestone and and gravel where you have a lot more sand and silt and vegetation yeah vegetation definitely a big deal Yeah, because it seems like march march you know february march you know the water is real crystal clear um and not doesn't have that uh it's big of a green tent. In the spring, with that clear water, those fish really see whatever you're fishing. They really see it. That can be good or bad. I mean, if you've got something that they just aren't buying, they're going to they're gonna see they don't even need to move for it. If you've got something that they are buying, they may move a little bit. They're not going to yeah. move all the way across the river. They're not going to move usually a rod length unless it's a streamer they're chasing. But And, and for streamers, so I'm, I'm going to back off of this and let's go on to streamers. I'm probably backwards to 99 percent of the people out there but as far as my favorite streamer goes i would say years ago two three four years ago it was a zoo cougar on a sinking line and i could i swear i could make that thing do just about anything i wanted to do i could fish it over around stuff over rocks over over blowdowns come out of the end of blowdowns i mean i really especially on clear water if i could see what i was fishing man i just i could get in a zone with that but now now i've kind of turned a corner for some reason uh or somehow i guess i should say and kind of changing techniques a little bit and i like to say i'm going to fish my bougie woolly bugger which is just a plain old woolly bugger uh and i'm going to fish it on a floating line and the reason why i said and i'm bending kind of experimenting with it the past few years and I'm getting more and more confident not in the bug itself because I think any woolly bugger any that type of fly any uh deceivers any of this will work but I think it's more of I might fish in two and three of these things now hook back to back and tie it on the bend tie it off in the bend tie it off in the bend sometimes four of them because I've never seen a bait fish or a or minnow let's say a minnow I've never seen just one minnow out in the middle. I see, you know, groups of them taking off whenever you, especially if you're smallmouth fishing, you know, you'll see groups of minnows take off, you know, whenever you throw something in. Same thing on the tailwaters, and I'm not dismissing the tailwaters here by any means. And I kind of got the idea from these Alabama rigs. I don't know if y'all have ever seen anybody fish one of those. I watched a guy fish one on, sure. on the, one of the tailwaters here one day, and just absolutely, it was obnoxious. It was all wire, had, you know, six six lures of some kind tied to it he was casting it with a bait caster you know around everybody and i was just kind of sitting there watching him and i mean he didn't even get a hit but 
I called my dad later and I was like, hey, this dude's out in the middle of the river, got wire and five lures on. He said, well, it's just Alabama rig. Multiple lures. You know, it's almost like some, you know, we're not bill, we're not fishing for billfish here. You know, we're not tra- trolling behind a boat, which it seems like it'd be perfect for that. But as I started talking to him about it, thinking about it, I started thinking, well, that's true. You see bait fish, they're, they're more together. Shad, you, I don't know if y'all have shad where you're at, but you'll see 20 of them take off at once and there'll be a trout right in the middle of them. He's probably thinking, thinking yeah and so like i'm safe here because when they take off i'm taking off i'm staying in the middle of them but you'll see hundreds of them sometimes moving through the water at one time so all these fish that that maybe bigger trout might prey on smaller fish they're all kind of bundled up together just like you see in the ocean so i kind of took that theory and just stuck stuck three of them on a floating line one day and i was with a friend of mine i said toss this thing out there and let's just see what it'll do well by the end of the day we had five of them on there and it kind of just became a joke of me saying well here let's tie another one on just see what happens Let's tie another one on. And it finally was like, I'm going to tie another one on. I just want to see if you can cast it. And he caught fish on it, which blew me away. It blew me away he could cast it. He's a pretty good caster anyway. But, I mean, that was a lot of a lot going on with that rig. All to the bend? All tied off to the bend, one after the other. Would they always, when you would add one more, would they always hit the back one? You never could tell which one they were going to hit. It, and that that's kind of when you start that? doing it, you're like, okay, let's see what they're going to Oh, he hit the middle one. Oh, that one hit the. That one hit the front one. It seems like less hit the lead fly than hit the middle to the back fly. It's almost like the middle flies get more action than anything. I'd be interested to see that rig on a tippet ring. Yeah, it probably would work on a tippet ring. Probably work really well, I would think. We'll see. Earlier this year, I had a brown, pretty good sized brown, eat two flies. The back one and the middle one. They were both hooked in his mouth. Like hooked in, you know, like he ate one in the roof and one caught in the side of his mouth. He ate two of those flies early in the year on a shad kill. I'm sure they're just down there gorging, you know. Oh, here comes a group. Here comes a group of shad. I'm going to get what I want to get. Line them up and ate them. And then here I was on the other end. And he was thinking, well, I had one more to go. So multiple flies on low water. It works okay, but on high water, it seems to really, really work. Even on a on a floating line, which is everybody kind of got got away from the floating line a little bit. I think short, short strips can't express that enough. You know, you don't have these long. You see these people. He's in, and I'll do it too. You have these long strips. Yeah, bait fish don't normally swim in a long strip like that. They'll go and then they'll yeah. Stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Maybe even slower. Sometimes, since I, I love the zoo cougar, and sometimes I'll tie it on the back. Two bully bugger clouser type on the front. Put the zoo cougar on the back, so it'll. You put it on the front, it doesn't have hardly any action to it because it's got that weight behind it pulling it. But you put it on the back, and you got some. Little, it's got a little more freedom back there. That's kind of where I come from, and I know that it's kind of weird, but it does seem to work pretty good. Yeah, we tried. We tried two flies. I don't know. 12 or 15 years ago and that's when we went to that sinking line and and light fly thing and we just immediately put down multiple flies and started fishing that heavy sinking line with a light fly so yeah i'm like it's like you said jordan you kind of come and go you kind of oh i'm gonna do this and oh now i'm gonna do this you know yeah and it all goes back to that confidence thing it's what you've got confidence at that moment whatever you know and that changes um i know it does for me and it, it's changed so much i mean I can look back eight or 10 years ago and, and throw in a streamer, which I used to tie them all. And I mean, they were just big marabou articulated streamers with like Senyo laser uh, dub heads. You know, I'd fish them by themselves a lot, but I was really big about putting a woolly booger behind them. And then for a while I was, it was putting a yellow woolly booger behind them, you know, like a small, you know, size 10 yellow yep. woolly booger behind a four inch five inch articulated streamer and i caught a lot of fish that way and you'll foul hook some fish that way you know i i noticed I, I would do that a lot you know back then but man i sure caught a lot of nice browns on that woolly booger behind that uh, streamer and even a red ass like i said you know or a big soft pack of any sort sometimes they'll swim up on that streamer and kind of freak out and end up taking the safer bet call that turbo nymphing yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love turbo nymph. Turbo nymph. <laughs> turbo <nymphing. laughs> I love it. So what are you fishing now, Jordan? What- What's my streamer? You know, when I made this list, I, I just thought of kind of some effective flies that would be good for people that were listening and, and whatnot. It flies that 
you know, sure enough work. I mean, there's a lot of big flashy streamers that I definitely fish on sink tip line when I'm streamer fishing for the most part. But for like a medium size streamer that you can not only catch big fish on, but still you know, catch fish throughout the day to, you know, make it interesting. I'm going to go with uh, John Barr's meat whistle on a jig hook. It's on her fly. Good choice. I think it was originally tied with cross-cut zonker on the head. I think Jamie, Matt, and I have all Palmer marabou around the front of them just to bulk them up a little bit. And you can make them as small as you want to, and you can make them kind of as big as you want to. I feel like that size probably two to four jig hook, 90 degree angle jig hook, size two and four, either Mustad or Gamagatsu seems to be what I use the most. You put rubber legs on yours or no rubber legs? I used to put a lot of rubber legs on them. Hadn't hadn't done that in a while. I don't, I don't either. Spice them up again. I don't think you need them. Right. One more thing. I used to. Oh, yeah, because John Barr puts them on right. his. <laughs> and the original fly call, it calls for them, but I, I'd rather go, you know, rabbit, flash, and marabou. Now, if I'm smallmouth fishing, yeah, I might put legs on it because I want it to be more crawdaddy or something. Right. You know? That's a little but, different. You bet. You bet. And you can fish it on a sink tip. I don't don't like fishing it on anything over a 250 grain sink tip obviously you can fish it on a floating line you get a lot more of a jigging action going with it but i'll tell you my favorite line to throw that on and i don't have one in the boat to have clients throw i i, I used to but i i've struggled finding a solid clear line that i like a lot like a good intermediate clear line for a weighted meat whistle i mean i think that's in the in the hands of somebody that just stays persistent with that setup all day i mean i think he's going to catch a lot of nice fish and a lot of different fish bass uh brown trout uh i'm sure you can catch redfish purple one for redfish would be awesome wouldn't it absolutely Black and purple you bet you could time as heavy as you wanted to or as light as you wanted to i like them fishing under a bobber i mean i'll i'll run those things you know there you go. freaking under a bobber man they're fun small mouth I'd fish them under oh, a bobber yeah. too you know absolutely uh, highly effective and then you could put a red ass behind it. If you <laughs> there you to. go. I've done that actually often. Meat whistle under an indicator. Meat whistle under an indicator with a red ass trail in it. I've done it a lot. Got a lot of nice fish that way too. You know, but you got to know how to move it. You can't just dead drift it. I mean, it's basically like a hybrid rig at that at that point. Like if you're in shallow water, you would be stripping that fast. You know, as soon as it hits the drop off, you'd mend, let it sink a little bit, and then make bump it and twitch it as that you know current is fading in that particular hole but you can take that fly even with an indicator uh you can take that fly and straight up fish it like a streamer you can dead drift it if you want to which rarely you would want to mainly just letting it have slack to sink and then bumping it twitching it or slowly stripping it it back up you know jordan is like super tuned in to the bottom to the to the bottom of the river yeah he's like every every one of his other than the dry but his answers on the nymph was the same thing, yeah. fishing across the top of the grass, getting in there and twitching, trying to keep it out of the grass. He just went through the same exercise with a totally different fly. It's different shapes. Yeah, but your technique fly, yeah. is sort of similar, uh, which is pretty interesting. How about you, Matt? You're on the white. My favorite streamer uh, in the last few years, I've caught my, my best fish, um, is on one of Andreas Anderson's flies, uh, the Unholy Diver. You're big into that. And when we talked the last time, I started, I, I followed him on Instagram. Like you said, he's got some really cool stuff out there. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it really is. Yeah, no, no, no worries. He's a super clean tire. I mean, his stuff is flawless. He uses a lot of those fish spines and multiple joints. And the thing I like about the Unholy Diver is that it is tied on a wedge head, 45 degrees. So I can fish that fly on a sinking line with no weight on the fly and with each strip not only is the line going down deeper but that fly is also going down deeper and it's shaking like a rapala because of that 45 degree head so as it digs it also shakes there's some other flies out there like the drunken disorderly that do that but and i'm not knocking the drunken disorderly it's a good bug but it has a tendency to spin Mm. where andreas's flies don't spin they don't kick over to the side because he's just so meticulous with making sure that that deer hair head is perfect it's it's incredible i would say for sure my favorite white river streamer Hands down, if I'm hunting a hog, is the unholy diver. Color number one, chartreuse. Color number two, 
tan and white. Completely different colors. Yep, yep. The chartreuse actually has a little bit of blue in it. It's a solid chartreuse and blue. It's it's a loud, bright, you know, just aggressive fly. And then that tan and white is more, you know, could be a, a creek chub or, you know, could be a young rainbow or cutthroat. I mean, it could be a lot of different things, but that's usually my approach is two polar opposites when I'm, you know, color wise. Yeah, right. Hopefully they're tuned into one. You don't have to go any further than what you what you went with the other. And that's right. That's what, and it's usually the case where you can, you kind of know, I mean, you fish the river enough, you kind of, you don't have to go white to black to, to light gray to, you know, dark olive to, you, you can hit on two or three of them. You get two or three different varieties of colors and you're going to, you're going to be in the ballpark and probably get some action on them if you fish that river enough. That's right. And if you fish a little red, you just need yellow. Isn't that right, Jordan? <laughs> yeah, it works pretty good. <laughs> that was always my favorite color there. It's funny. I, I don't have any yellow streamers. That's probably means something. That's right. That's you right. Know, it's because they were good and I lost them all and I need to restock. <laughs> you can usually tell what flies are good. She ain't got none. Yeah, and that's true. Let me stop right here just a minute. So if you find value in these podcasts, and I hope you do, we started getting hats and decals and t-shirts and those sorts of things to kind of support the podcast. It takes a little bit of money to do this. And if you find value in it, if you go to the Southeastern Fly store, so it's southeasternfly.com forward slash store look in the show notes i'll put it in there cruise through the store and if you find something that you like proceeds go to supporting the podcast i do it for helping people catch more fish i do it because i've listened to a bunch of podcasts to kind of keep myself up with the new techniques and, and new information and new places to go like i said if you find value in in this content you want to support southeastern fly podcast there's a lot of cool stuff out there already and there's more coming if you if you want to support it that's that's probably the only way we don't take donations we don't basically don't have any sponsors so we don't have anybody we have to answer to we don't have any agenda that we have to to check boxes on we just kind of do our own thing i get people i like but a lot of my friends with these guys have been really cool today or tonight i guess i should say it's what almost 10 30 now which is way late for david that's probably really early for y'all but man it's about it's at, no it's not <laughs> it's at least an hour, to, hour and a half past my bedtime Lucky yeah dogs. so but anyway i get people that i like and and i like to have good conversations i think as it, i'm thinking back through here both of y'all have given me some things to chew on some of it i've done before and like jordan used like you said put it down i'm going to pick it back up now and try it uh and hopefully i've given y'all something to think about and maybe try we said the top 10 tailwater flies matt you kind of stole my thunder because i was thinking man I'm, i like fishing top water terrestrials but i'm gonna go with an ant kind of to round this 10 out i love fishing ants ants are always eating something right they're always there you get one in your house a week later there'll be ten thousand. it's the same way whenever they're eating something on the on the riverbank maybe they're maybe they're crawling on a on a blowdown there's a lot of ants on blowdowns apparently ants are pretty clumsy you can look around and you can find them in water throughout you know the summer so i like to fish an ant i like to fish a dry ant almost the bigger the better i think it's because i can't see if a fish blows up on an ant you don't really have to be able to see too much the seeing part i kind of want to see how close i am to something am i close to that blowdown and that sort of thing so i think to round out our top 10 tailwater flies i'm just going to throw the ant out there I encourage everybody to go out there and try an ant, uh, and it would work on any of the, any of the Arkansas waters, any of the Middle Tennessee waters. There are ants everywhere. There's probably ants out in Steamboat in there, in there, Matt. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty sure they'd work out there. Absolutely, man. I will tell you, most fun ant fishing I've ever done is San Juan River. Really? You bet. Right there in the middle of the desert. When you say it like that, it makes total sense. Yeah, it's fun fishing out there. About September, man. Just ants, ants, ants. I can remember dad talking about you know they've uh-huh. been out there a lot they'll fish a lot of dry fly ants talking about watching the fish come all the way from the bottom answer answer good uh i yeah. highly recommend them good pattern good choice yeah jordan you're a you're a guide for rouse fly fishing you want to you want to talk about that just a second going out to the little red yeah yeah i work for, for rouse fly fishing here on the little red we're a orbis and doors fly fishing guide service been working for them for eight years now matt uh, you know, working for Jamie, doing the same back in the day. And me and Matt became friends. And uh, Matt was kind of the reason that I got into guiding, honestly. He gave me the ropes. That's where I'm at. And Matt, you're, you're, you own Rising River Guides on the, on the White River. 
Uh, like I said, you're a longtime guy, an excellent angler. You've been a good friend of the podcast. Always good to have you. You always have cool answers. If you want to hear more from, from Matt, he's uh, he was the guest on episode 26. Uh, we were pretty original on that. We named that Fly Fishing in the White River. <laughs> Keep them guessing. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to. We get original, right? But uh, yeah, that's right. So you're you're out in steamboat just for the, I guess the rest of this week. That's right. That's right. Yeah, our last day fishing will be Friday, and then it'll be heading back to the grindstone um, in North Arkansas. We um, got a whole bunch of rain, uh, you know, this spring, and our lakes are full. So lucky me, hopper fishing should be pretty good this uh, summer, and should be should be a fun year. Looking forward to it. You should try an ant. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Maybe I'll put an ant behind my hop my hopper. There you go. I'm putting it behind a woolly bugger. That's right. <laughs> there you go. If you enjoy the podcast, please check out the merch at uh, southeasternfly.com forward slash shop. That supports the podcast. Subscribe or follow the Southeastern Fly podcast, and that way you'll you'll know whenever one of the episodes drop. We try to drop the episode the first Monday of every month. If you share it with your friends, that, that's a lot of help to us. Uh, that spreads the word. Uh, hopefully helps more people become a better angler. But you just listened to Southeastern Fly, Wisdom from the Guides, Round 4, the Top 10 Southern Tailwater Flies. Thanks for joining us on Southeastern Fly. All right, guys. Boom. Oh, he's gone. He gone. He's gone. He's getting gone. Gone. Nothing's going to bring him back. <laughs> Maybe you get a little rain. Put some of that. Put some of that down anyway. But sure, hope so. We're, we're supposed to get a little tomorrow. Good. Well, like you say, make the most yeah. of it. It's about all you can do. That's right. That's right. All right, guys. Talk to y'all later. Peace out, boys. Thanks. Bye.